Hello and welcome to our first episode of Mythovers. So today we'll be running a simple sandbox experiment, which is essentially an analog model of a four and thrust belt. We want to observe the effect of the Komo dip on the formation of an accretionary prism. According to a study conducted by Hemin and Bruno in 2003, we should expect a wedge that is shorter, steeper, and higher with a larger dip of the decomo. For our experiment, we chose a decoma angle at 2 degrees from the horizontal. Our results will then be compared to other experiments ran with a flat decoma dip of 0 degrees and a steep dip of 5 degrees. We haven't got all of it, so, so let's, let's get, get started, started with preparing our, our setup. setup. Initially, a detachment fold was formed when a pair of fore truss and back truss uplifted the middle portion. We notice how the pair of fore truss and back truss faults form a conjugate truss fault pair, with the maximum stress direction, sigma 1, perpendicular to the line that bisects the two faults, and hence is close to the horizontal. After pulling the sandpaper to create more slip, we notice that more forks are formed and the angle of these forks get rotated out of their original angle as more slip occurs to maintain an ideal accretionary taper. There is also ductile thickening of the strata above the basal detachment that causes further amplification of the fold. At the end of the deformation process, we observe that a fold and thrust belt system has formed. A total of 8 forks were formed. Two of them are back thrusts while six of them were four thrusts, which grew towards the wedge toe. Thus, there are two general dip directions for the forks, one for the four thrusts and another for the back thrusts. The wedge grew in height and shortened in length as new imbricates formed in front by accreting undeformed sand. Finally, we measured the different fork angles and we found that the back thrusts are much steeper compared to the angle of the four thrusts. Moving closer to the wedge toe, there is a general decrease in the dip of the faults. The four truss show a shallower dip due to an inclination between sigma 1 and the decomo base. We also notice that deformation observed from the front and back of the sandbox are different. From the front, only folding was observed with no obvious offset of layers. None of the layers slipped out of sequence with younger strata lying on top and older strata below. However, from the other side of the box, we observed that there was obvious offset of layers, which clearly indicates a thrust fault dipping at 20 degrees. This set older layers on top of younger ones, forming a repeat stratigraphic sequence. However, the front and back of the sandbox are similar in that all the four thrust faults propagate to the surface. We can match the bumps on the surface when viewed from the top, to the four thrusts that propagate below. To determine how the dip of the decomo affects formation of the Krishnari prism, we compared our results with similar experiments conducted at different decomo angles. Our fixed variables are thickness of the layer and the coefficient of basal friction by using the same grid size of sandpaper. Based on dips of 0, 2, and 5 degrees, the overall trend shows that a steeper decomol dip gives a greater height of wedge, as well as a shorter wedge, and thus a greater amount of shortening. A steeper decomol dip also leads to a larger critical taper, which is the alpha plus beta value. This agrees with our initial hypothesis. But how do we explain all of these observations? 
With increasing lacoma did, there is greater shortening of the wedge and the sandbox models accommodated a greater amount of the shortening by lateral compaction in the form of layer parallel thickening rather than propagation of the basal decoma. Now, let's investigate how the decoma did affects the critical taper value. This can be explained using the critical taper wedge theory, which follows the equation below. It may seem complicated, but in a nutshell, an increase in basal dip results in a smaller surface slope, alpha, and hence an overall decrease in alpha plus beta values. We also decided to investigate the effect of the variables we fixed previously, thickness of the sand layer, and coefficient of friction. To investigate the effect of thickness of the sand layer, we compared our results to an experiment conducted with a thinner layer of sand of 3 cm, keeping all other variables constant. Thicker layers result in a smaller number of faults formed, they are more widely spaced. Thinner layers have a larger number of faults which are more closely spaced. We concluded that this may be explained by faults propagating over a longer distance for thicker layers. We also determined the effect of the coefficient of basal friction by comparing our results to an experiment conducted with a larger coefficient of basal friction, keeping all other variables constant. A smaller grid size of 80 has coarser grains than a larger grid size of 120. From our observations, a larger grid size produced a larger critical taper angle of the wedge, which led us to conclude that a larger grid size corresponds to a smaller coefficient of basal friction with respect to the wedge of sin. The relation between critical taper and coefficient of basal friction may be explained by the following equation, which shows that the critical taper increases with the coefficient of basal friction, and the converse also holds. In summary, we learned that, firstly, an increasing dip of decoma gives a shorter length of wedge, a higher wedge height, as well as a larger critical taper angle. Secondly, we learned that a thicker layer of sand produces fewer faults and more widely spaced faults. Lastly, a smaller grid size gives a larger coefficient of basal friction, as well as a larger critical taper angle. Thank you and we hope that you enjoyed our first and probably the last episode of Mid Provers. <laughs>